Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Midwest Prairie Summer Service Co-op for 2021. As our congregations begin planning to reopen in-person gatherings this fall after our long pandemic separation, we take this opportunity for a series of virtual visits with some of our neighboring UU churches over the summer weeks. Each Sunday, you are invited to experience inspirational messages from a variety of our ministers, together with music and other elements that make our communities special. We hope that this morning's service will engage your thoughts and lift your spirits, giving you courage to make a difference in the world and helping to strengthen the connections that sustain us all. Good morning. Welcome to worship with the community of the First Unitarian Church of Omaha. My name is Sherry Woodbury, and I serve here as the settled minister. We are happy to be participating in a UU summer worship co-op with about a dozen other Midwest congregations. This morning's worship service is our contribution to that collaboration. I thank all of our members who helped put it together. And on behalf of this church, I offer you a warm welcome in your virtual visit here. Like other Unitarian Universalist congregations across the prairie, First Unitarian Church of Omaha is a community of many genders and sexualities, a community of diverse racial and class and cultural backgrounds, a community of varied abilities and gifts. Some here find inspiration in the great books, others in the great outdoors, and others still in great conversations. Whoever you may be, we welcome you to bring your whole self into this gathered community. Welcome. Come, enter the sanctuary of sibling seekers. Perhaps you arrive feeling more separated than ever. Separated from old routines, from friends, from clients and coworkers, from health, from old haunts, 
even church. Perhaps you settle in with heightened appreciation for our connectedness across congregations, through Wi-Fi signals and fiber optic cables on the ocean floor, connected by songbirds and pollinators and distant coral reefs, connected by community spread and practices of mutual care. Maybe you drop in with uncertainty on your heart, uncertain of who our country is or really wants to be, uncertain still which voices your child's school officials will listen to as they set safety policies, uncertain what the changing climate and disappearing species portend for us all. Or maybe you show up to remember what you do know, that no one needs to go it alone, that nature heals, that all are precious, that each has something to offer, that change is possible, that love will lead the way. Separate, connected, uncertain, yet grounded, we arrive this morning. Come, let us worship together. Today, Vanessa Timberlake and Dick Fleeby, part of the First Unitarian Church of Omaha community, will kindle the flame of our faith. If you have a chalice or candle at home, you may light yours as well. We light this chalice, lamp of our heritage, for the light of truth, the warmth of community, and the fire of commitment. I'm Christina Strong, Lifespan Director of Religious Education at First Unitarian of Omaha, and our story for all ages today is Scaredy Squirrel by Melanie Watt. And our book begins with a warning. Scaredy Squirrel insists that everyone wash their hands with antibacterial soap before reading this book. And if you become curious, as I did while reading when this book was written, the answer to that is 2006. Scaredy Squirrel never leaves his nut tree. He'd rather stay in his safe and familiar tree than risk venturing out into the unknown. The unknown can be a scary place for a squirrel. A few things Scaredy Squirrel is afraid of. 
green Martians, killer bees, tarantulas, poison ivy, germs, and sharks. So he's perfectly happy to stay right where he is. Advantages of never leaving the nut tree. Great view, plenty of nuts, safe place, no tarantulas, poison ivy, Martians, killer bees, germs, or sharks. Disadvantages of never leaving the nut tree. Same old view, same old nuts, same old place. In Scaredy Squirrel's nut tree, every day is the same. Everything is predictable. All is under control. Scaredy Squirrel's daily routine. 6.45 a.m., wake up. 7 a.m., eat a nut. 7.15 a.m., look at view. 12 noon, eat a nut. 12.30, look at view. 5 p.m., eat a nut. 5.31, look at view. 8 p.m., go to sleep. But let's say, just for example, that something unexpected did happen, you can rest assured that this squirrel is prepared. A few items in Scaredy Squirrel's emergency kit. Hard hat, antibacterial soap, calamine lotion, parachute, bug spray, mask and rubber gloves, net, band-aid, sardines. What to do in case of an emergency, according to Scaredy Squirrel. Step one, panic. Step two, run. Step three, get kit. Step four, put on kit. Step five, consult exit plan. Step six, exit tree if there is absolutely, definitely, truly no other option. Uh, this is just a dramatization. Exit plan. Exit one, note to self, watch out for green Martians and killer bees in the sky. Exit two, note to self, do not land in river if unavoidable. Use sardines to distract sharks. Exit three, note to self, look out for poison ivy and for tarantulas roaming the ground. Exit four, note to self, keep in mind that germs are everywhere. Remember, if all else fails, playing dead is always a good option. With his emergency kit in hand, Scaredy Squirrel watches. Day after day, he watches until one day, a Thursday at 9.37 a.m., a killer bee appears. Scaredy Squirrel jumps in panic, knocking his emergency kit out of the tree. This was not part of the plan. Scaredy Squirrel jumps to catch his kit. He quickly regrets this idea. The parachute is in the kit, but something incredible happens. He starts to glide. Scaredy Squirrel is no ordinary squirrel. He's a flying squirrel. He feels overjoyed. Adventurous. Scaredy Squirrel forgets all about the killer bee, not to mention the tarantulas, poison ivy, green Martians, germs, and sharks. Carefree, alive, until he lands in a bush and plays dead. 30 minutes later, one hour later, two hours later, Finally, Scaredy Squirrel realizes that nothing horrible is happening in the unknown today. So he returns to his nut tree. All this excitement has inspired Scaredy Squirrel to make drastic changes to his life. Scaredy Squirrel's new and improved daily routine. 6.45 a.m., wake up. 7 a.m., eat a nut. 7.15 a.m., look at view. 9.37 a.m., jump into the unknown. 9.45 a.m., play dad. 11.45 a.m., return home. 12 noon, eat a nut. 12.30 p.m., look at view. 5 p.m., eat a nut. 5.31 p.m., look at view. 8 p.m., go to sleep. And P.S., as for the emergency kit, Scaredy Squirrel is in no hurry to pick it up just yet. The end. At the Unitarian Church of Lincoln, we have a big vision. 
We aspire to be a loving community, uniting reason with spiritual exploration to transform ourselves and the world. Each week on Sunday, we take up a collection to support the work of our church. If you'd like to consider a contribution today, you can click the donate button in the footer of the website, www.unitarianlincoln.org, or you can give via text giving. Simply text UC Lincoln and the amount to 73256. We are going, heaven knows where we are going, but we know we will get there. Where 
knows how we will get there, but we know we will. I am hyper alert outdoors for the shape of poison ivy. I've taken to hiking with a hat on for fear of ticks and Lyme disease. And these days, I see germ and virus vectors everywhere. So I can relate to Scaredy Squirrel. Oh, hi. When the pandemic started, I quietly holed up at home with my pod people and waited for it to pass. Maybe this was our equivalent of the squirrel playing dead. When authorities laid out rules for containing the risk to myself and others, I dutifully followed them. Scrub hands like a nurse, check. Wear a mask in public places, check. Sanitize hands when returning to car from a store, check. Forgo eating out, singing with others, and vacations, check. Having guidelines clearly spelled out made me feel less vulnerable and the world a little less uncertain, you know? Perhaps for the same reason, I share with Scaredy Squirrel a penchant for plans. When our congregation, after many months, at last adopted a stepwise reopening plan, I could feel the tension in my body drain away. Remember the beginning when we had no plan for how to transition to a new way? Now, even though we don't know exactly when or how, we know another transition is coming and we can take deliberate steps to prepare. I, for one, appreciate Scaredy Squirrel's prudence. I do. Even though it may seem he was a bit overcautious at times. Alas, not all creatures have this same capacity for assessing risk. Take painted turtles. When these turtles migrate, they may take the same routes year after year, traveling convoluted paths to reach a reliable body of water. One study found painted turtles arriving within 10 feet of their previous destination, even on a long migration route. Their precision is amazing. Sadly, when human highways encroach on turtle territory, it can have fatal consequences. Like in north central Iowa, between Clear Lake and Ventura Marsh, a news story tells of a group of kids there, boys of 8 to 10 years old, who recently set out to help the turtles. Saddened to see numerous turtles, mostly babies, flattened on a street in their town, the kids spent a summer day plucking the turtles from danger. These young, soft-bodied, two-legged creatures, able to sense a threat, scooped up the hard-shelled, four-legged friends and carried them safely to the other side. They saved upwards of 30 turtles that day, and perhaps 200 so far to that point in the summer. The solution for turtles trying to get to the other side of the road offers a reminder for people trying to make it safely to the other side of the pandemic. Some of the same principles apply. Those of us who can recognize the danger of COVID-19 and do something about it will be helping to carry the others across to safety too. For example, by getting the vaccine as soon as I am able, I help everyone else, especially those who are not vaccinated. Not only the people who have a hard time taking the time off from work to get the shot or to recover from side effects, but also all those children too young yet to be vaccinated, and the cancer survivor whose weakened immune system receives only modest protection from the vaccine. Let us all be like those caring kids and do our part for everyone.
Well, before there were cars hurtling over highways in Iowa, endangering turtles, there was the Iowa Sisterhood. Perhaps you've heard of it. These were Unitarian and Universalist women of the frontier and the late 1800s and beyond who created a web of mutual support. Like the turtles, these women knew their territory well, and they were determined to help their species of religious liberals on the prairie survive. Unitarian men with degrees from Harvard Divinity showed little interest in roughing it on the frontier to help free religion move west. So it was homegrown leaders who adapted to the challenge of planting enlightened religion in these new mission fields. The prophetic sisterhood, as historian Cynthia Grant Tucker called them in her book of that title, faced different conditions and brought different sensibilities than their male counterparts back east. They embraced the rigors of frontier ministry with zeal. Religious leaders in 2020, on the other hand, did not have the same choice as to the challenges we faced. COVID-19 came to us and we had to pivot to a new way of keeping our communities connected. Now, I don't know about you, but when this challenge arrived, I did not relish it. Online worship, parking lot programs, endless Zoom meetings. We didn't sign up for this. Nor did any of us choose to navigate a fluid and inconsistent set of risks and rules as we try to educate our kids, continue our livelihoods, connect with social support systems, or keep working for justice. We didn't sign up for this, but we had to decide how to respond, and we have to keep deciding how to respond. Are these new ways of doing church temporary, or are they here to stay? Is it good or bad that we've had to do a bunch of things differently in church and in life in general? Consider the parable of the Taoist farmer. One of our members here at First Unitarian Church of Omaha, Lita Magisana, will share the story with you. And then we'll give you a few moments to reflect on the parable. There was once a farmer in ancient China who owned a horse. You are so lucky, his neighbors told him, to have a horse to pull the cart for you. Perhaps, the farmer replied, one eyebrow raised. We shall see. One day, he didn't latch the gate properly and the horse ran away. Oh no, this is terrible news, his neighbors cried. Such terrible misfortune. Is it, the farmer asked. We shall see. A few days later, the horse returned, bringing with it six wild horses. How fantastic you are so lucky, his neighbors told him. Now you will be rich. Maybe, the farmer replied. We shall see. The following week, the farmer's son was breaking in one of the wild horses when it kicked out and broke his leg. Oh no, the neighbors cried. Such bad luck all over again? So it would seem, the farmer replied. We shall see. The next day, soldiers came and conscripted all the able-bodied young men to fight in the war. Because of his injury, the farmer's son was left behind. You are so lucky, his neighbors cried. One eyebrow shot up as the farmer said again. We shall see.
share this story not to dismiss the impact of the pandemic. The losses have been heartbreaking, the scale vast, and the crisis continues. And yet, there's something in the farmer's even keel temperament that I can't help but admire. There's wisdom in his judicious wait and see attitude. For we can't always anticipate what the future consequences of current events will be or predict what will happen next. On the Midwestern frontier, Unitarianism and Universalism faced what seemed to be a great challenge, luring learned men from the East to serve religious liberals on the rough prairie. But hidden in this challenge was a great opportunity to discover how women could contribute to our tradition as ministers. The Sisterhood successfully organized and tended Unitarian churches in Iowa, South Dakota, Illinois, Ohio, Minnesota, Michigan, Wisconsin, and more. What would come from the trailblazing efforts of such ministers? Time would tell. Religious leaders in Omaha were intrigued by these charismatic and practical women. In 1891, Newton Mann, perhaps the most exalted figure in the history of First Unitarian Church of Omaha, invited the founding saint of the sisterhood, Mary Safford, to preach at the dedication of a new addition to the church building. This one was not the first house of worship in Omaha to welcome Safford's oratory. As I learned last year from a visiting Jewish historian, she preached at the local synagogue the year before. Its newsletter gave this report. If there was any prejudice existing among the members of the Congregation Israel as to the introduction of a lady preacher into our rabbi's pulpit last evening, all such feeling melted away as mist before the sun when that lady, Miss Mary Safford of the Sioux City Unitarian Church, opened her lips. The newsletter piece concludes, her sincere, open countenance, her unaffected simplicity of manner at once seized the attention of her audience and held them spellbound until the last word of her lecture had died away. And one might imagine praise and plenitude flowing in from Boston to support this vibrant new leadership on the frontier. A few accomplices, like fellow Midwesterner Jenkin Lloyd-Jones, backed the sisters' efforts. But the male establishment back east was disinterested at best. Over several decades, Mary Safford and her network of female colleagues on the plains persisted and flourished. They gave chance after chance for denominational leaders to take them seriously and invest in their success. But the trend did not change. Eager to return to a manlier ministry, the Boston Brass pushed out the prophetic sisters within a few decades. The Iowa Sisterhood did open many hearts and minds on the prairie. The communities they served responded to their gifts. Yet the women were only able to open the door to institutional power a few inches. Not enough for many women to get through or to shift the denomination. Right here in Omaha, the Unitarian minister, Newton Mann, made many waves with his then groundbreaking preaching on evolution, and perhaps even his daring to invite a woman as a guest into his pulpit. But it wasn't until 1996, 1996, that this congregation called a woman to serve for the first time as its minister, an interim temporary minister at that. The opportunity for women to serve as ordained leaders was passed over for almost a century. We face our own set of challenges in 2021. Will we seize the opportunities they present? Every sector of society is grappling with this now, asking questions like, 
what innovations from this period should become mainstays? And what old ways do we need to let go of to make room for them? I look at our churches and wonder if take-home religious education kits are here to stay. And how we will recalibrate smaller gatherings like committee meetings and affinity groups to get the right balance of in-person and online formats. And here in Omaha, I wonder how we can make multi-sensory, multimedia worship the new normal in this beautiful historic sanctuary, which at the moment is not equipped for it. I'm not certain what the answer is, but I believe the overarching question is this. Will we help our faith move with the times, or even allow liberal religion to be the leading edge of change, or we keep our tradition frozen in place and time, stuck in doing things the way they've always done it, limited to a group of people or leaders who are just like the ones who came before. I hope we will proceed with vision and courage and joy. I believe we can do this. We are doing this. Because what a loss it would be if our liberal religious descendants, a century hence, were to look back and see our time as an era of wasted opportunity. Now I say all this, but I know it's overwhelming. Big thinkers tell us that a crisis of the scale of this pandemic will reorder society in dramatic ways, speeding up a process of change that compared to prior eras of human development was already at a breakneck pace in the modern world. So of course, this is overwhelming. For individuals and for organizations like churches, there's so much to decide, to rebuild, to create anew. We will have to do our best. And with each stage of our unfolding story, we will have to wait and see what comes next. Over the long pandemic winter, as I hold up with my pod people, we played a lot of ping pong. You might think the same game would get boring after a while, but it's a very dynamic game, especially with well-matched players, which my spouse and I are. Something kind of different happened through this seasonal marathon of ping pong. We would each have rather long winning streaks. We're still well-matched, so I wondered what could account for this. Hmm. I think I figured it out. When I was on a winning streak, it was largely because I was leaning into my strengths, so deliberate in my placement of the ball, lobbing it from one side and then the other side, making him run all over to hit it back. And when we had gone back from the table to return a long shot, aiming it next, for that spot just over the net on his right, which now he can't reach quite in time. And the edge shots barely on the table, the ball sometimes just brushing the edge of the table on the way down to the floor. Those were my particular skills, and I made the most of them. My husband had a very different approach. He was constantly experimenting with his technique, putting out a spin on the ball that made it harder to anticipate what it would do once it bounced in my side changing up his serve, discovering that it was challenging for me to return a particular type of high-velocity serve, and reinventing his strokes every couple of weeks so I had to keep adapting to him. He wanted to keep our long winter ping-pong tournament interesting, and he did. In our churches, and in other areas of life where we are making these leapfrogs in development, we can all do both of those things. Build on our strengths, including our ability to think strategically, like I was doing in ping pong. Where do I want that ball to go next? And keep experimenting. Just try different things and see what works, as my husband did. Now, it's true that when we try new things, we open ourselves to failure. But that's okay. 
As my daughter likes to remind me, this is one of the ways we learn. And what looks like failure at first may, in fact, turn out to be something else. The story of the prophetic sisterhood on the prairie reminds me how wise the Chinese farmer is to wait and see how a particular turn of events will play out over time. At first, these bright women were so successful in serving the needs of religious liberals on the plains, but deprived of institutional support. Within a few decades, the network all but disappeared, and women's foothold in the ranks of ordained ministers was lost. A missed opportunity, absolutely, but not a failure, I don't think. For Mary Safford and all the other women who forged a new way of doing church in the Midwest did make a lasting mark. The prophetic sisterhood helped the denomination stretch theologically. The early women ministers introduced their parishioners to relational forms of ministry that knit families together in hard scrabble places and helped them thrive. When pushed out of their pulpits, these stubborn pioneers took their leadership and their zeal for reform into the public sphere, paving paths of community ministry that we recognize as important expressions of our values today. And when the stories of this prairie sisterhood were at last rediscovered and told, they inspired future generations of Unitarian Universalist lay people to believe that they too could be ministers. I count myself among them. So despite the ways that their efforts were limited by the short-sightedness of others, I see tremendous gifts and successes in the ministries of the Iowa Sisterhood. We too can bring care and courage as we embrace the challenges of our time and see how far we can move our faith forward together. And let's not forget what Scaredy Squirrel learned when he finally, not quite how he meant to, left his tree. His assumptions about what was possible for him were upended. Scaredy Squirrel had talents he hadn't even discovered until the crisis of falling out of his tree. He could fly. Over these last 16, 17 months, we too have found hidden talents. In our own ways, we have flown. And so we too can make the choice to change some of our routines. And even as we pace ourselves and keep using our safety plans, we can enjoy the adventure and feel more alive. May we embrace the opportunities that lay before us with courage and vision and joy. So may it be. Amen. So the day will arrive when we will be together and no longer will we live in fear and the children will smile without wondering whether on that day thunder clouds will appear wait and see wait and see what a world there can be if we share if we care you and me wait and see wait and see what a world there can be if we share if we care Some have dreamed, some have died To make a bright tomorrow
As we move forward together, let us support one another and remain grounded in the enduring values of our faith. May we have the patience to wait and see how events play out, even as we embrace the positive opportunities of our moment in history. May it be so. Amen. Thank you all for joining us here this morning in Omaha. We look forward to future services with all of you as our summer worship co-op continues.